in my opinion, the most exciting part of a movie is talking about it after. Welcome, Christy. Thank it's you. nice to have you back. Thank you. How does it feel to be in the auditorium and not on stage? Uh, nice. It's nice to not have this. Well, no, I do have a spotlight on me, so never mind. <laughs> never mind. But it's nice to you know get to see how the audience sees everything. So. For sure. Um, I wanted to start the, our conversation today sort of by discussing the films you've chosen and why in particular you settled on these three films. Mm -hmm. So I worked with Michelle Steen, so it wasn't just me, uh, manager of public programs, but we wanted to go for something that was as diverse as possible. So we start with The Kid, which we were between The Gold Rush and The Kid, and I kind of fought for what we ended up with, which was The Kid, because I, I think it's the most sentimental Chaplin film. And I think when you think of Charlie Chaplin, you're not really thinking of emotional depth. And I think that that was kind of a nice twist for audiences and it plays well to large audiences as well. Um, and then there's the obvious connection with Granville Redmond, he appears in it. So that's great. It's a great tie in for the exhibit. Um, and then Nosferatu takes us, you know, similar time period, but takes us all the way to Weimar, Germany to see a totally different style and German expressionism and it's a lot more about the atmosphere and the physical space and even if I was to think of another silent film that is as atmospheric as Nosferatu, it would be like Sunrise, which was directed by the same director just yeah. in Hollywood. So it's nice to see F.W. Murnau, you know, when he was still in Germany before he became an expatriate and um, the film that's probably his most famous. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, and with silent film, because you have a more limited means of communication, it's cool to see the space kind of become a character mm -hmm. and um, sort of like assert itself in its own right. Uh, so I'm really excited for that screening and it's obviously a lot different from yeah. the kid. And then finally the artist takes us all the way to 2011, um, but shows us that you know silent film can still be successful. Um, it's not the highest earning best picture movie, but it's also not the lowest. Okay. You know, I mean, it beats out The Hurt Locker considerably, and yeah. that won the year prior, I believe. Okay. Um, so there was good turnout for it, and um, I think it reminds me a bit of like La La Land. Okay. Because it's sort of like a love note. It's like a memento, and what's nice about it is that. It's going to shed some light on the transition to sound, yeah. what that meant for the industry. And whereas in the other movies, we'll be talking about what happens in them. You know, in The Kid, I talked about a lot of the narrative and it's very isolated from the industry. The artist is about the industry. So we'll get to talk about the impact that sound had on silent film stars. We'll get to talk about uh, synchronized sound. We'll talk about um, slapstick and that kind of acting and so it'll be a cool chance for like reflection and I think retrospective that you couldn't obviously achieve in the 20s because it's happening so <laughs> yeah, it's nice yeah. to scoot really far forward and see kind of um, just like I mean how film has become such a topic of conversation mm -hmm. it's like in the 20s film was not in colleges, it was not considered an art form in general. So to have it, you know, be made into this kind of like nostalgic, sentimental, silent film, um, and then have it be successful is kind of testament to how much it's grown in public favor, I think. So, Christy, when, so when you're putting together the series, I'm sort of interested to know how you've felt about the connection between Granville Redmond and Charlie Chaplin. As you mentioned previously, the series is in connection with our Granville Redmond, the Eloquent Palette exhibition upstairs on the third floor. Um, so in that process of putting it together, um, were there things that sort of stuck out for you in the friendship between the two? Mm -hmm. uh, when we were putting it together, um, I kind of spoke a little bit about the variety we were trying to achieve. Um, in terms of Granville Redman, I didn't know anything about him or about his friendship with Chaplin, so it was 
as much a surprise to me as it is to, I think, all of our museum guests that go into the exhibit and don't expect to see that, you know, film clip and sort of a whole section devoted to Charlie. What I think is interesting, and we actually have a quote, I believe it's like a poll quote in the exhibit, is Chaplin believed that because Redmond was deaf, he had this kind of supernatural, exceptional ability to recognize happiness and joy in silence. And when we think about that, that's very Chaplin's career. So I kind of thought of it as Redman was kind of Chaplin's Chaplin. Um, we look to Charlie Chaplin to make us laugh and to bring us joy in silence. And I think that he turned to Redman for that. Um, and I think he got a lot of inspiration from not just his works, but just him as a human being. He talked about, you know, him communicating through ASL and being um, very performative. Like he kind of suggests that all deaf people are performative to an extent because it's so gestural. Um, so it was interesting to think that Chaplin's The Tramp didn't just come from that one incidence of the costume. I think that's what a lot of people like to kind of um, relegate it back to is he put on the shoes and they were massive and he thought, oh, I should walk like this. And then the character came into being. And it's interesting to think that through these relationships, he also kind of figured out a different way of communicating. What I didn't get to talk about when we screened the film is the fact that I think it's interesting that Granville is in the film as a friend of a painter and the painter is not made to look very good he's and so it's kind of a little bit of a dig at that stratosphere of um art and of people it's kind of like fine art and you know upper class which film was definitely not at the time so i always have wondered what they were trying to achieve with that i don't know if it's redmond being kind of in on the joke i don't know if it's his ultimate way of saying that he believes that film is an art form too. Um, it's a very interesting kind of self-reflexive moment for him to be pretending to be the painter's friend and kind of putting down that lifestyle. So I think it was probably, if anyone knew who Granville Redmond was, it was probably quite surprising and very um, subversive at the time. On your point about the performative nature of silent film. Um, what struck me in your presentation the other night was the intersection between gesture, body language, and communication. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to that about you know how they intersect, what kind of how they influence each other, mm -hmm. um, and how we see that on the screen mm -hmm. in many of the silent films. Yeah, um, I think it's worth noting that any of the intertitles that we see in the kid are so much less expressive than the actual film and the actual gestural language and the body language that Chaplin and, and Jackie Coogan. I mean, I think Jackie Coogan, mm -hmm. you can't underplay the response that he gets from audiences when he's like crying and he's reaching out and it's so dramatic. It wouldn't play well now, it's too simple, but yeah, I think, you know, putting it in the context of that time it's very kind of arresting and he looks like he's actually crying and they still don't feel the need to close up on him because they understand that putting your arms out is such a universal sign of I want something, I am powerless against something, you know, and to have a child do it is like just that much more powerful. Um, but even Chaplin, you know, I like to focus on Jackie Coogan a lot because I think that he's the most emotional, but Chaplin, when he's like pantomiming as the boxing coach, yeah. that gets another really big reaction because you don't need him to tell you, I'm gonna pretend to be the boxing coach now and I'm gonna kind of like do all these things that you're used to seeing in fights, you know? He just does it and then you catch on and you understand that there's this kind of sub story mm -hmm. happening within the story where you know him and the kid have both taken on now different roles within the narrative mm -hmm. um which is just a really seamless 
and effective way of storytelling. And I think like Chaplin knew, I mean, he said, I know I've talked about the shoes before, but you know, when he would walk with his turned out feet and he kind of has this weird waddle, it just gives him, he's very uh, approachable. He's very endearing. He is the little tramp. So he's not even, I mean, he is sometimes the tramp, but he's very um, innocent yeah. in a way. Yeah. Um, so I think that even just in the simple movements of the way that he walks and the way that he laughs and things like that, um, he's very welcoming to people. People can identify with him. So it's interesting that you say that you tend to focus more on Jackie Coogan. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Um, I think... Put you on the spot. No, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I honestly, if I really think about it, it's because when I think of the kid, this is the scene that I think of. Mm -hmm. So I think of him being in that truck and him like reaching out and look, he looks like he's actually crying. Mm -hmm. And that just struck me. I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, this doesn't look like he's acting and it made an impact on me. It's why The Kid is probably my favorite silent film because I think in the midst of so many antics and a lot of slapstick comedy, especially if you see like a Buster Keaton film mm -hmm. where it's very much about the stunts, I can be impressed by that, but I'm not moved by it. The Kid stands out for me because I'm very moved by it. And I think that Jackie Coogan is probably the most powerful person okay. in it, actually. Yeah. It's an interesting comparison that you draw between Chaplin and mm -hmm. Buster Keaton. Do you think the sort of the gestural nature of their acting is very different and that's what creates a different emotional response? Or do you think it's actually the way the scenes are staged or set up? Well, Buster Keaton is always like, he's very, you know, I mean, Charlie Chaplin, he kind of has like this like funny yeah. laugh that he does and he pulls a lot of faces and he's like a little bit more not like a clown, but he, he's definitely out to entertain. Okay. I think versus Buster Keaton, I think much more of like scale. I think of really elaborate stunts and like trains and house frames and, you know, big bridges and things like that, where you're not close to the body at all. You mm -hmm. have to be far away in order to like really get the, the grandness of it and kind of how daring it is. So I think just even in that limited exposure to him, it kind of uh, makes it a little bit more difficult to feel emotionally connected. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's easy to be impressed by him. Yeah. I, I think Buster Keaton's really impressive, but I'm not as uh, emotionally uh, pulled one way or the other in his films. I like that, the way you've set that up, because <clears throat> one thing that I responded to particularly in The Kid, was because there's no dialogue. Mm -hmm. I'm spending a lot more time focusing on the film, you know, mm -hmm. focusing on the actors, the way that they're using their body, focusing on the set. And I'm interested to hear your, your thoughts on the role of dialogue. Um, you know, I, I feel dialogue can be quite dominant when it comes to filmmaking. Yeah. You know, and a lot of people tend to respond immediately to dialogue and perhaps... Mm -hmm think or see less about what's happening mm -hmm. beyond the dialogue mm -hmm. so um yeah i mean i think dialogue definitely i mean we have a whole category two categories dedicated to adapted screenplay and original screenplay it's all about the writing i actually do really love good writing in a film like i love an aaron sorkin film but i do think that there, I think it's more difficult, obviously, to make an impact without saying everything that you're thinking. And there's actually a scene, I don't know why it's the first thing that comes to mind, but it's um, at the end of The First Man with Ryan Gosling. I'm not sure if you've seen it. Not yet. Anyways, yeah. <laughs> uh, he go like, he's the first man on the moon. He comes back and he hasn't seen his wife for a while. And he's sitting on one side of the glass because he has to be quarantined because they're not sure yet if, you know, he's the first man on the moon. So 
he could be carrying anything. Yeah. <laughs> and she comes to see him and she sits down and they look at each other on both sides of the glass and she just puts her hand up and then he puts his hand up. And it's the most like beautiful, wonderful way to end the film. I don't need to know what was said between them. And I think that in my opinion, the most exciting part of a movie is talking about it after, in my opinion. So I think that the spectator is the most important piece. So when you don't say everything, you give the spectator a lot of power. You give you a lot of trust, actually, that hey, I hope that you've understood what I've been trying to say this whole time. And so now we're so in sync with each other. Or you're so invested in this that I no longer need to say it. You understand now what I'm saying. So. I mean, with silent film, you don't get to establish like, this is my way of speaking and this is my dialogue. But I do think that there, you can still establish a certain tone and you can still create kind of the, the rules and the boundaries of a world, you know, for people to understand. So like when Chaplin goes and hugs Jackie Coogan at the end and he walks into the house, I interpret that as somehow he stays in the kid's life. Like he lives with them. It's not just a visit. It feels very final to me. Um, because to me, Chaplin's saying biological parents aren't necessarily our only uh, closest bonds. And so I think that because of the way that he's told the story. Other people might think differently, but I do think that having those moments where nothing is said um, lets the audience kind of control the story little bit more. You made an interesting point in your presentation the other night about the fact that nothing is said in a way sort of help Charlie Chaplin maintain his image. As yeah. If, I, if I'm remembering correctly, mm -hmm. you're talking a lot about his push for the sort of universal appeal. Yeah. And it was also kind of a sense of self-preservation for him because he knew that if he spoke, he would have a British accent. And that would, I mean, he was wildly successful in the US and a lot of people could relate to him. So if he spoke with a British accent, that kind of disillusions everyone or kind of um, creates a, a barrier now between him and the uh, public. So I think that he, I think, yeah, he fought for the fact that he knew that the Tramp's power was in the fact that it, he was universal and he knew that if we kind of add too many elements of Chaplin himself, then he becomes too specific and he, it's not sort of this archetype or this symbol for us to kind of project all of our own woes or our clumsiness or our desires or whatever onto. It makes him too much, it makes him too real to speak. What was his first um, talking film? It was The Great Dictator in 1940. So he held out for a very, very long time. Because you think about it, first silent film, or not first silent, the first use of synchronized sound is in 1927. So he holds out for a very, very long time before he finally, uh, you know, lets the audience hear him speak. I think he did speak very quickly or there's something to it there he didn't really say something like I think he hummed in a movie before he did Great Dictator but this was his first time speaking actual dialogue so I, I, haven't, I haven't yet to see the artist myself so mm -hmm. I'm really excited to see it when it when it does arrive here but my understanding of the story is sort of this uh, dynamic between silent film era and the invention of talkies and mm -hmm. kind of the nostalgia for the silent film era, but also the, I don't know, the difficulty of transitioning from silent film to talkies for film stars. And um, Do you think Chaplin experienced that yeah. at some stage? And do you think that sort of connects to the, the experience that the characters and the artists deal mm -hmm. with? I think that Chaplin probably had a difficult time thinking that his way of storytelling was becoming outdated, um, especially because he was one of the pioneers of cinema to kind of make it known that you're no longer at the forefront of your medium. It must be really difficult. Um, but the artist, I think about, um, 
actually really similar to Singing in the Rain. Singing in the Rain does a similar thing where it kind of shows you this transition and how difficult it could be for silent actors, especially silent actors that had come from Europe. Um, so like an example of someone that would have to transition and it was very obvious that she was not from the United States would be like Greta Garbo. Mm -hmm. And like for some people it worked and for some people it really did not work. And so I think it's kind of um, shedding light on some of the, not hysteria, but I mean, it can get a little crazy when, when, I mean, film at this time is like the Wild West. Nobody knows what it is and you're still figuring it out. And so to have built a career and then all of a sudden find that you have to, you have to speak now too and you have to memorize lines, uh, put a lot of people out of work. And so that's when you see kind of the fall of a lot of silent film stars and people don't know them as well. Um, like Lillian Gish, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know her as well. Yeah. Um, versus like if I say Greta Garbo, like you know her because she was able to transition, you know. Um, so I think that the artist is interesting because it shows you kind of the duality of innovation. It's like this is a very exciting thing for us mm -hmm. and for you know pushing the needle forward and for the medium but it did um kind of changes who is qualified now or it kind of cuts down talent and it opens the door up for new people so mm -hmm. it's sort of just a revolving door you know and that's kind of exciting but also scary yeah sure um this idea of transition um I think a lot about in terms of Nosferatu as well. I think of its relationship to German Expressionist painting and that transition from, you know, the sort of brush and paint, mm -hmm. um, very expressive gestural nature, and then to putting that on the screen, trying mm -hmm. to capture that kind of mood. Um, do you feel like there's a boundary between film making and video art? Do you think, or do you think that they are? too intricately connected to be separated? That's a really tricky question. Um, my first instinct is to just point out how they can be different in terms of exhibition. So, I mean, we're doing research right now for a program that's coming up on video art. And so there's a lot of installation. There's a lot of, there's like a performance quality to video art that I don't think film has quite harnessed um, but people are constantly making films more immersive so you have 3d you have mm -hmm. you know 360 screens you have um, there's chairs now at movie theaters that will move with the action if it's like a thriller mm -hmm. or something like that I know that they're experimenting with scent as well so movies are moving towards that making it a total sensory experience, but I do think that video art um, is just innately a 3D experience, uh, or it can be. It has more to play with in that way. But, I mean, the distinctions between like video art and film, I mean, it's not even... Like, the names are even funny. We don't shoot on film anymore. Yeah. And, you know, we don't make videos anymore. You know, um but that's what they're called and these names and kind of the distinctions like even TV becoming kind of irrelevant at this point especially with you know like the advent of a lot of HBO shows and Netflix and stuff where you have TV that's got the production value of a movie so and what do you call that and then video art was originally about decentralizing communication systems like trying to um, give everyone a voice so then if we factor in, okay, well, what about now YouTube? Is that, is that, yeah. Does that become video art now? Because that's probably more democratized than being a video mm -hmm. artist, right? And, so, you know, or if you, even if you take, you know, videos and stuff on Instagram, Snapchat, I'm not saying that all of those are, <laughs> are art, they're not. But when you talk about giving power to the people and you talk about the portable camera and just how accessible it was for people to tell their stories, it just, I mean, now anyone can tell a story. So I think that 
knowing what's video art versus film versus YouTube versus TV is just, it's only be gonna become more difficult the, as time goes on, yeah. So do you think people experience film differently in a museum context compared to like a Cineplex? Uh, yeah, I think that they have to. I think that, you know, the museum space and specifically the Crocker has been a lot about trying to carve out, you know, what do they bring to the table in terms of a movie experience? Um, because why would you go to a museum to see a movie when you could go to the movie theater? And I think that because the Crocker has hired, you know, guest speakers and people that were either involved with production or people that are well versed on the films, um, it offers another dimension to the experience and it allows uh, guests to immediately have a dialogue um, afterwards. And it just kind of, um, I think, is a bit more of a catalyst for thinking and um, engaging on a deeper level. And it's very clear to me uh, through working with lots of guests at the Crocker that they come very hungry to engage and they're very ready to go there with you and they are ready to think um, to get into higher thinking and critical thinking and so I think to have this space is kind of like a haven for the film culture and kind of film lovers in Sacramento that a uh, movie theater can't provide you know I mean I said um, the other night when we screened I think it's very it's almost magical that we're all sitting in the same room and we're going to watch this film together and then we're going to talk about it because especially in the age of streaming and small screens, the movie experience has become so uh, solitary if you want it to be. Um, and even when you go to the movies, you go, you sit down, you sit in your seat, you don't talk to anybody, watch it, get up, leave. Then you talk to your friends or whoever you came with after. But what was so great about the other night is that people that didn't know each other are now all having this conversation as a collective and, you know, it, you're all part of the conversation and you meet new people and it's just so important to keep that in mind, I think, for a film that it's supposed to be a collective experience. Um, even for me, I watched the kid on my laptop in preparation for uh, the series and getting to watch it with everyone and hearing everyone laugh and react and go like, oh, and it's just, it's a different movie. It's, it's the way that people were supposed to see it. So um, I think that bringing people together in an actual, like a true authentic way is what the museum brings to the movie going experience. Awesome. Well, thank you for being here today. Thank you. We look forward to the uh, next two screenings with you and to see how the series evolves over time. Uh, yeah, until we see you again soon. Thank you. Thanks for having me.